they might not want to leave uh, a witness, the only witness. So I was like, they're gonna chuck me overboard. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Hello. Can I come on board? Yes, you may. Hey there. Welcome to my ongoing series about solo sailors and their adventures. The idea behind that is that I'm always conf or often confronted to the same questions. And though I saw that it's a good idea, uh, to meet all these adventurous sailors and yeah, interview them. Today I'm on the boat of my good friend Thomas. Hello Lars, welcome on board. Thank you, nice to be on your boat. Uh, Ju Julia? Julia. Yeah, it's a long time ago we met the first time. So for the beginning, may you introduce yourself? Well, I'm Thomas and I'm currently in the Caribbean and I've been sailing now full time Mm -hmm. and working remotely as a web developer for about a year and a half now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, what got you into sailing solo? I mean, it's a tough job. Um, well, I've been sailing around for most of my life and I fell in love with cruising mm -hmm. in 2017 when I took a sabbatical for a year and a half mm -hmm. and coming back after that time I just couldn't get used to land life and of course I had to work for yeah, you know money yeah. but all my thought was bent on doing doing that again going sailing but my partner at the time uh, didn't really feel like going for a, an extended period again. Mm -hmm. We did do some cruising, like uh, seven weeks in Norway, and it was actually her suggestion, because we had two boats at the time uh, that we were living on, mm -hmm. and then she said, "Why, if you're so restless, why don't you this summer, you know, do a solo trip to the Azores?" Yeah. So that's what happened. I refitted the boat, Julia, that I'd bought a year and a half before. And once I arrived in the Azores, I knew I couldn't go back. So I decided, even if it was to be alone, I would continue my travels. So it's some kind of a unplanned, planned solo sailing? I think my partner at the time she saw it coming. Mm -hmm. um, despite that, I think it must have been quite a shock to her. Yeah. And personally, I wasn't planning on it. I knew it was a possibility. Uh, but yeah, life is short and you can't keep waiting to fulfill your dreams. Yeah, Especially if the opportunity is there and it feels right because I had this very strong feeling that the ocean was calling me mm -hmm. and not going back north but going back south visit the Canary Islands again mm -hmm. and possibly do an Atlantic crossing which uh, I did last year in December. Many people say there is never the, the right moment to start but yeah, sometimes <coughs> your you know, inner voice forces you. Um, Okay, and you talked about refitting your boat. What kind of boat is Julia? This is a an ML 46 Marumu catch. Mm -hmm. So two masts, 14 meters long, and yeah, for one person, quite enough space to live on. And it's relatively uncommon, Thomas. Mm -hmm. I, I hardly seen sailors or solo sailors with boats big like that? Uh, yeah, it, 
I, I don't really meet that many solo sailors, but usually they are on slightly smaller boats. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I was not planning on buying a 46 foot boat. Mm -hmm. It would have been looking forward too big, too expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. But once I saw this boat and realized that if you have a catch, it's actually quite manageable with one or two people. Mm -hmm. And the boat was a steel. I could buy her for a really good price. And she was in excellent shape. Mm -hmm. So the refit was mainly for safety, uh, you know, doing the rigging, uh, working some on the, on the engine and making the boat livable for a liveboard situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and do you have some let's say special equipment to to handle a boat like this or yeah I've, i have autopilot and uh, a wind vane which steers the boat uh, by just mm -hmm. using the wind uh, which uh, on long passages is very comfortable and it saves you a lot of uh, a lot of power as well yeah. and if you plan on spending a lot of time in anchorages or at sea, you need to have enough power to, you know, power the navigation and autopilot when you're using it. So I refitted the boat with some solar panels and mm -hmm. uh, wind generator. So I am completely self-sufficient in power. And in fact, I only spent six days in a marina in the last uh, almost two years, um, which means <coughs> I have quite an autonomous existence. Mm -hmm. And in combination with my desalinator, the, the water maker, which provides all my drinking water and also for showering, mm -hmm. I only have to go to shore for food. Yeah. Okay, so you, you don't have all this crazy available electronical stuff on board? No. I've tried to keep the boat as simple as possible mm -hmm. and the reason that I decided to buy the boat, one of the main reasons was the lack of furling mainsails mm -hmm. which are, uh, which can be prone to breaking and are quite expensive to replace. Um, so I have just the regular sails that I have to pull up by hand mm -hmm. um, and also reef by hand so yeah, that makes everything uh, a lot less technical mm -hmm. and I think this is also the way I refitted the boat to have the least amount of equipment mm -hmm. that needs maintenance um, of course when you live on a boat you need lots of stuff to keep everything running mm -hmm. but the having the bare minimum um, means I have a lot more time and when things don't break, you don't have to buy new things. Yeah, less maintenance. So less maintenance, less cost, mm -hmm. which also means you have more free time to, you know, enjoy the Caribbean. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, keeping it simple has definitely a lot of uh, upsides. But now let's talk about being alone at sea. I mean, a lot of people expect really <coughs> challenging situations like fighting storms or pirates, but how is the reality? <coughs> Have you ever been in yeah, dangerous situations and how does it feel being confronted with that alone by yourself? Yeah, um, it's actually counterintuitive. I didn't expect this myself. Uh, mm -hmm. because I was used to sailing shorthanded mm -hmm. which means uh, two people so usually uh, one person who is the skipper and um, and then the second mate it's usually a couple you know and mm -hmm. um, they don't want people on the boat so that's what I was used to um, with ocean sailing and I've been in a couple of bad weather situations uh, on my old boat and uh, I had water ingress you know the whole floor of the boat covered in water and yeah that's when when the adrenaline starts pumping mm -hmm. and you know you have to find the leak uh, get the water out 
and sometimes you have to hand steer the boat for for too long and you get uh, that's the dangerous part um, you will get fatigued and when you're very fatigued you haven't slept well for a few days uh, and you've been hand steering it's very possible to make uh, the wrong decisions when something happens but when I started solo sailing for me it was actually uh, easier because I was not responsible for another person so for me it was always slightly more exciting uh, and it felt more dangerous when I have crew on the boat because I do feel responsible and as the skipper you are you know uh, your choices can can turn out really wrong if you make the wrong one so um, and as for braveness of course if you're not an experienced sailor and you haven't ever sailed overnight or uh, done a long passage the first few times it's going to be very exciting and you're going to be aware of all the dangers but when you're an experienced sailor you usually take baby steps and you know you're doing day sailing and then maybe you do a crossing 24 hour crossing to this island and with the years um, every time you want something new it's not doesn't feel dangerous you don't need to be brave it's something that calls you and that you look forward to mm -hmm. um, I remember when I uh, left uh, La Gomera in the Canary Islands for the Atlantic Passage which would take like 20 days and it was a 2800 mile passage and I had two relatively unexperienced crew on the boat mm -hmm. yes they were scared um, but I remember feeling only excitement <laughs> yeah, that's really good yeah so uh, yeah, you kind of lose that thing and it's not a matter of being brave when there's no fear of course with yeah. experience comes a, a secure feeling but sometimes you are confronted with new and really dangerous situations uh, one time this year mm. when I was uh, on passage to Union Island which is just to the north of Grenada mm -hmm. and I left from uh, the British Virgin Islands which is a f about a 400 mile trip mostly upwind against the current and the forecast was for fairly light winds mm -hmm. so I decided okay it's now or never and I needed to get here for uh, the hurricane season mm -hmm. and I think it was on the second day I noticed my first ship on AIS uh, on my chart plotter I could see there was a vessel coming so I kept an eye on it and the strange thing that I uh, noticed was that it reduced its speed to about six knots and suddenly we would be passing very very close by and the ship was about two hours away and I was getting maybe a bit paranoid but I decided uh, I don't trust it and it was a vessel registered in Venezuela which added to my paranoia uh, <laughs> <coughs> yeah so I decided okay it's probably nothing you know don't have to worry too much but I went full pirate mode, so I turned off my uh, AAS beacon so they couldn't see me digitally. Mm -hmm. And I turned off all the lights. It was just before sunset. And I changed my course 30 degrees to the east, mm -hmm. which would bring me about three or four miles behind the ship instead of 500 meters in front of it. Mm -hmm. So I felt pretty safe and I made some dinner. Uh, had it in the cockpit and the moon came out for a bit but lucky for me it got a bit more cloudy and so visibility was pretty poor I could see the ship and its lights mm -hmm. and while I was passing behind it I decided to lay down in the cockpit and look at the stars and then I heard this sound of, a, of an auxiliary boat crashing through the waves and I could hear the engine 
and they were doing a search pattern mm -hmm. in the middle of the Caribbean Sea and that's where I started to get scared mm -hmm. um, I went onto my laptop and for the first time in my life I had an SSB transceiver which enables me to send emails mm -hmm. from my boat wherever I am so I sent an email to my parents <laughs> with my location and just short what was happening um, and then I went back into the cockpit but I was so frightened um, the things going through my mind were these might be actual pirates and I know that pirates uh, have usually no respect for life mm -hmm. If they're going to board me, to steal my stuff, they might not want to leave uh, a witness, the only witness. So I was like, they're gonna chuck me overboard you know, after they steal. You know, I have nothing much of worth on the boat. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to defend myself? So in my mind, I was preparing the Molotov cocktails and my spear gun was loaded mm -hmm. on the couch inside. But I couldn't actually, and it was dark, and they were doing a search pattern and they were coming closer and I was in the cockpit and I barely I was on the floor so I was peeking out trying to make the least amount of so sound I could conditions for me improved when the wind uh, increased slightly and the clouds covered the moon and the stars and I was doing about five and a half five and a half knots going past the ship and the last pass that um, the auxiliary boat made it went behind me and then I thought okay now, now I'm in trouble they have to be able to see me but apparently they didn't and then they passed off uh, back to that ship which was now around five six miles away and I was shaking for at least an hour yeah, I think every every sail I can feel you and yeah with crew maybe it's even worse, panicking together. And you can panic together, but having to witness your partner being raped would be on my mind as well. So that was one thing that I didn't have to deal with. Yeah. And I hope this was not what I uh, thought that it was, but for a ship to approach me this way, send out an auxiliary boat to find something in the middle of the Caribbean Sea I couldn't find any other explanation other than they're going to be curious mm -hmm. or they're actually looking to you know board your boat and yeah so that was I think my most uh, frightening experience on the ocean mm -hmm. yeah good that they didn't found you and nothing bad happened yeah Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, another often asked question is if you are on a long passage, you are all by yourself. So I think it can be challenging that there is nobody to talk to. I mean, your, your brain starts working maybe because of problems. You run out of money, partner mm -hmm. quits, whatever, and then the thoughts are yeah, running in circles and I get that question a lot mm -hmm. and when people ask me the question usually they have a kind of suggestion that it must be lonely mm -hmm. and I think it really depends on your personality and how you experience uh, sailing uh, I think if you're an overly extroverted person it might be really bad for you mm -hmm. bad for your mental state <coughs> but when you're a loner like I am uh, and you really enjoy the sailing um, it's like you enter a meditative meditative state and th usually the first few days I will spend a lot of time reading because mm -hmm. my brain is more used to having uh, lots of input and of course you have to navigate and sail the boat, but when conditions are stable, there's really not that much to do. Mm -hmm. So it could be 
could possibly be a bit boring and my brain at the first days on passage will uh, you know it will need some stimulation so I usually read mm -hmm. um, and I spend extra time writing in my ship's log and my journal if I'm keeping one at the time but uh, usually when after two days I can just sit and stare at the at the waves and watch the birds mm -hmm. and other sea life if you're lucky you meet with dolphins and mm -hmm. if you're even luckier you will see whales and the feeling of euphoria that you get when you're in that mental state where you where you live uh, only for the moment because you know you know it's going to be another week before you have to take down the sails mm -hmm. The feeling of euphoria you get after meeting with these beautiful animals, it lasts for days sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they enter your dreams um, when you sleep. So I've, I've dealt with loneliness all my life, but when I'm, when I'm at sea, I'm never lonely. Okay, Thomas, now before we have a look inside your boat, if we are allowed to. I have a final question. I know every sailor hates this question, but what are your plans? Well, you know, um, I'm not really uh, that much of a planner. Mm -hmm. And one thing I enjoy about the freedom that I have now, um, I don't have to be anywhere. Mm -hmm. Apart from the weather that dictates my movements, like in the hurricane season and uh, you know when you can leave on passage, um, I'm totally free to go wherever I want. And it has been a dream of mine to circumnavigate mm -hmm. uh, the world. So, yeah, um, my next passage will be to Martinique to get some stuff for Julia and mm -hmm. provision. And that's where I'm going to decide where to go. So once I decide to go west, I will have to navigate the Panama Canal, which is not something I'm looking forward to. Mm -hmm. It should be an interesting experience, but uh, I, I'm mostly looking forward to crossing the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. But it's also very well possible that uh, I, at t uh, in one or two months from now, I will decide um, I need to get back to Europe to see my parents and maybe my family and friends. And yeah, Europe is a fantastic cruising ground, Definitely. but it, it kind of depends on uh, if I just spoke to someone back home, mm -hmm. then I feel okay. The Atlantic Passage is it's the North Atlantic. It's also a challenge. It should mm -hmm. be pretty awesome to do and I can continue my uh, circumnavigation next year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, always a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Okay, let's have a closer look on Julia. Space. 
Yeah, that was the first episode of my new series about solo sailing. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, give me a thumb up and subscribe me. That helps me really a lot. Yeah, about this video, a few words. It was harder than expected with all the camera gear and microphones. Maybe you realized that sometimes it was not that smooth, but the next one is getting better, I think so. Have to buy some new gear and then it's fine. Um, if you want to support me, I have my own company. It's called Captain Olsen's Natur Cosmetic. It means organic custom, not organic customs, or organic cosmetics. <laughs> Sorry. And yeah, we sell over whole Europe. Um, hand cream, lip balms. What do you expect from an organic cosmetics company? So would be nice to have you as a new customer that keeps me on sailing and yeah with the us and don't pinch your fingers bye